I have to get over and talk to you. So, we'll be available here. Yeah. yeah, right now and forever. My eighth or seventh, my eighth grade is studying the kind of issue all the time. Yeah. Okay. But I don't think any of my eighth grade is actually. Yeah, you know, um, I don't think the quality is going to be that great on this, but those guys, they're going to have a proper recording. Oh, that's more than a tape. We're going to say we're a sandwich next town over. Uh, maybe they'll send you a tape. But this will be on YouTube as well. Right. Yes, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Thank you. We need to start in a second. <laughs> the warm air will stop running soon. <laughs> the 
there's any control there, we well, Okay, sure, hold on a second. It's probably needed to <laughs> Actually, it looks like we have some more folks coming in, so we're just going to wait a few more minutes. Uh, we've contacted facilities to uh, see if we can adjust the temperature. the Admirals Hall in Mass Maritime Academy. I want to thank Mass Maritime for letting us use the facility. I also want to uh, say on behalf of uh, Governor Baker and uh, Secretary of Transportation, Stephanie Pollock, uh, welcome to the first uh, public informational meeting for the Cape Cod Canal Transportation Study. I am Ethan Brooklyn. I work for Mass DOT. I'm in the planning department and I am going to be, or I am the project manager for the study. This is uh, our agenda. Uh, we're going to go through, uh, you know, welcoming and introductions. Uh, a bit about the study background purpose. Uh, go through our study process and our framework, how we're essentially going to uh, conduct the study, and our schedule, next steps, and then uh, open up for discussion, questions, and answers. Uh, so again, my name is Ethan Brickland uh, from SDOT. Uh, also, Diane Madden, who uh, is not here yet, uh, she works for our environmental division. And uh, we also have uh, in attendance Mike Walsh from the Army Corps of Engineers. Mike, do you mind standing up real quick just to say hello? And, uh, and then we have our study team. So this is our uh, 
our contracted uh, traffic engineering and transportation consultant team. Uh, and uh, we have uh, all four uh, the individuals here today. Uh, Ed Hollingshead, Bill Reed, he's uh, over to my left, and uh, Mike Pawlonski as well. And, uh, and then you may have met Ken, uh, Ken Buckland over here to my right. So uh, you know, between I and, and those four individuals, uh, they'll be the primary uh, face of the study and those that you'll see uh, throughout the process. So I'm going to go into just a little bit about the study background and purpose. So on this slide here, we have um, our rough study area, but I think the primary takeaway on this are the, as we all know here in the room, the Bourne and Sagamore bridges are the primary means uh, to get from the mainland to the Cape. Uh, they are owned by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, they link 15 communities and over 200,000 uh, residents with the mainland as well as the islands. Now, the Corps owns the bridges, uh, DOT owns the infrastructure around the bridges. Uh, so that's Scenic Highway and Sandwich Road. And uh, until recently, uh, getting to the Cape uh, involved a lot of peak season, delaying congestion. Uh, and then in the off season, it was uh, congestion dropped significantly. And uh, you can characterize it as uh, unimpeded off season access. Um, but now uh, the off season uh, is getting uh, more and more congestion uh, because of lane closures uh, to uh, allow the ongoing bridge maintenance. And I guess the primary question uh, people ask themselves uh, is why is this happening now? So two bridges, uh, they were uh, designed in the early 30s and they were uh, finished uh, construction in 1935. Uh, in the 30s, when we built bridges, uh, the design life was 50 years. Uh, now, when we build a bridge, the design life is 75 years. And uh, in 2035, which is uh, our, our study's future year analysis, uh, the Warren Sagamore bridges will be 100 years old. So uh, essentially, uh, they're built for the last 50 years, they'll be 100 years old. And uh, the reality is aging infrastructure requires a lot of maintenance, and especially uh, in saltwater environment. Typically, bridges are there uh, to either bridge over uh, roadways or waterways. In this case, we have a lot of salt water. And as the aging continues, uh, different elements of the bridge uh, will deteriorate at varying rates. And so uh, that's why they need to be inspected regularly. This graphic here uh, shows essentially the uh, closure and the overall bridge closure as well as lane closure schedules over the past uh, uh, you know, 70 years or so, 80 years. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, the yellow lines represent lane closures. They're getting more frequent. And that's just the reality of structural deterioration of concrete and steel in a saltwater environment. And this is, this is very typical of, uh, of bridge, bridges throughout uh, Massachusetts because we have a lot of coastline and a lot of saltwater environment. So this, uh, this slide here really just um, is a, a text narrative of what the prior graphic was. And, it's really meant to, uh, to highlight that you know, in the first 40 years, there, there were you know, five or six closures between the two bridges. And then uh, 25 years between 1975 and 2000, they started to close more, have more lane closures. And in the last 14 years, uh, there have been four lane closures. And as you can tell, uh, recently, Sagamore has had a lot of uh, painting and lane closures going on. So uh, it's just getting more frequent is the point of uh, these slides. So, uh, but what, uh, with that said, uh, there is not a risk to safety. The bridges are inspected regularly, and they're obviously maintained on a regular basis. Uh, and the bridges can be maintained for decades, uh, however, with associated impacts to mobility, uh, again, referencing the off-season uh, delays, and then safety, uh, lane closures uh, could impact emergency response times. <laughs> And as well as the economy, uh, you know, it uh, affects goods movement, uh, it affects uh, tourism uh, during season if there will need to be any uh, closures. <clears throat> so, as I noted earlier, the Army Corps of Engineers, they're responsible for the canal as well as the bridges over it. 
DOT is responsible for all of the other infrastructure. So the primary point of this slide is that Mass DOT and the Army Corps is here today in attendance. Uh, we're coordinating our efforts uh, to identify a long-term solution for reliable connectivity, both uh, over the canal and also our charge is to look uh, in the canal area as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mike Walsh of the Army Corps. He's going to talk a bit about what they're doing uh, on the Army Corps side. So again, my name is Mike Walsh. Um, I am the project manager for this study that the Corps is seeking to undertake. Um, right now, we're in the very beginning phases of this. Um, and this is um, concurrent with, but not directly connected with what the um, state DOT is um, working on. The core has a process, actually. Yeah, the, the core has a process to make that decision whether or not you're going to uh, keep repairing or rebuild. Uh, if anyone like me drives an old car, drives it in the ground, you have to make that decision sooner or later when you're going to replace it. Right? We're at that point once again with these bridges to make that decision. So we have a process to uh, conduct a major rehab evaluation study. Uh, we go through this process to hopefully sell the story to decision makers up the chain into Washington um, for our recommendations. And I can't tell you what the recommendations would be at the beginning of the study. I'll tell you what I hope they are, what I expect they might be, but I, I don't know for sure. But the process for a major rehab study, we have to establish the engineering condition and reliability of the bridges. We have to identify and define any problems and um, opportunities uh, as we seek to work on these bridges. Develop alternatives and cost analysis. Uh, identify economic benefits and evaluate environmental concerns. And also do environmental coordination on that. So again, the question is, do we repair? We keep repairing them. Those are the lane closures that you see often. It's probably going to be more often if we don't replace the bridges. Um, they are old bridges. So repair or replace. The next steps that we have for the Corps. Right now, I'm trying to see funding to start this study. <gasps> My first step is to develop a project management plan and a study plan which lays out what we will do for this study. Uh, next step is secure funding for the study, uh, conduct a study. The study could take up to three years. Uh, we don't have the plan yet, so I can't tell you how long that will take. Uh, after the study is completed, next step is secure more funding, and then uh, we go to the next step, which would be if it's a uh, a bridge replacement would be design memorandum, uh, design documentation, design, and then finally construction. And every, each one of those steps, the federal government, we have to go back and So it's, it's kind of a long process, but that's what I'm stuck with. That's mine. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, understanding that uh, we need to uh, figure this out uh, both cooperatively, but also we have a responsibility as the, the DOT uh, to maintain, uh, you know, mobility, connectivity, and safety. Uh, Mass DOT has become a three-part approach, and I'm actually going to turn it over to uh, Ed Holland's head from our consultant team uh, to present a bit. And uh, at the end, uh, we're going to take questions and answers. Hi again, uh, good evening. I'm Ed Hollingshead. I'm with Faye Spofford and Thorndike. We're the consulting firm that's been retained by uh, MassDOT to work with them on advancing the study. So you know, what we've heard uh, to date is, uh, oh sure, I'm sorry. Um, what we've heard today really is, is a sort of a summary, a high-level summary of what one of the big issues here is. Obviously, it's the it's the 
deteriorating bridges due to their rate. So I'm just going to try to describe for you what the planning process is that we're going to use to um, document what the problem is, what some of the potential solutions for the problem could be. So to start with, as Ethan uh, has said, there's a three-part process that's going on here. And part one is this study. That's really what we're here to talk about tonight. And that's really defining the problem and potential solutions. And what will come out of this planning study will be a number of solutions which we will present to the public, that we vetted through the public, which will then advance to the next stage of study and analysis, which will occur at a state level, which is NEPA, and a federal level, which is NEPA. And that will be a process of several years with much more detailed analysis that will happen in this initial planning study. So that's ultimately where our planning study is going. Our study is also generating traffic data and conceptual costs, which can be used for the ongoing public-private partnership process, which is the P3 process, which you may all have heard about. That's the process that could, if this is funded through that private process, end up with structures that would be built that would have tolls on them. Part two of this process is the environmental review process that I just mentioned, the NEPA and the NEPA process. Again, much more detail than what we're doing here. Part three is really running concurrently with those two. Because of the uncertainty of the availability right now to identify where funding would come from, either from the state or from the feds, in the case of the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, there's this third alternative out there which is uh, sort of the newer alternative over the last few years, which is the P3 process. And we're simply evaluating, is this project's cost and potential um, money that could come from tools? Is, it, is P3 even a potential? Because right now, no one really knows if it is a potential. So again, just to keep flexibility for future funding, that P3 evaluation is sort of going on through all of these uh, steps. So again, just to get back to the study that we're here to talk about tonight, basically this is a standard kind of planning approach to a study. Um, we're trying to identify and analyze at a conceptual level problems in the canal area. This is problems both along the canal and problems traveling over the canal. It's not just about a new bridge over the canal. The idea is to develop a multi-phase, multimodal. It's not just about cars, also bikes and heads, buses, transit. Uh, plan that we could be implemented to improve transportation mobility along and across the canal. The study project, study product, I'm sorry, will basically be a report which will include basically an implementation plan which will stretch out over short-term short project improvements, medium-term and long-term projects. So there are ways that we could roll out smaller, most expensive improvements, perhaps to improve sidewalks, bikeways, retime signals, uh, along the corridor, and then ultimately as the years roll out to the long term, perhaps the bigger solution of what is the solution for reliable cross canal connectivity. The way that the Mass DOT does these studies um, is, is a five step approach, um, which is it's kind of a, a, again, a typical approach to a planning study. We're right now in step one. Uh, goals and objectives, basically defining, you know, what is, what is basically what's the problem and what would you like to see for solutions for that problem? How would we know success when we saw it? What will our evaluation criteria be? And how are we going to continue to engage the public? So that's developing the public involvement. That's the step that we're in, and we're just going into uh, step two, which is basically trying to understand what are the existing and the future conditions along the canal area. So for us, existing is. 2014. We started in the summer of 2014 to collect traffic data to try to understand what the summertime traffic conditions are going to be like. We also collected traffic data in the fall to try to understand the off-season on um, transportation conditions. So our existing is 2014. Our future year is 2035. So basically those 2014 conditions, traffic volumes will be projected up. 2035, we'll look and see how do things work in 2035? Based on what we find, we'll go to step three, alternatives development. We'll try to identify solutions or projects which could help to um, alleviate some of the problems that we see in the near term, the mid term, and then ultimately in the long term. We'll come up with a range of alternatives. We'll bring those alternatives in front of the public. Um, we'll vet them with the public. We'll 
people can comment on their alternatives as concepts. We will then move to step four, where we will analyze those alternatives and we'll start to think about not only how well do they work, but what do they cost in terms of impacts, the natural environment, the open environment, the financial, what do they cost? And now that whole process will move to step five, which is again the recommendations that final report with an implementation. Just uh, briefly, this is our uh, larger study area. You can see that it's outlined in, uh, in dashed yellow lines. That's an area within which we're, we think we can capture the bulk of, of the physical and the traffic implications of improvements and changes along the canal. We also have another area that's basically a mile outside the canal where we're going to look at a much more detailed way. So again, to back up, we're in phase one, and one of the things that we try to come up with in phase one of the study is, you know, what are our goals? What are our goals and what are our objectives? And so these are draft goals that MassDOT has come up with and proposed. We propose them to another group, which we'll speak about in a minute, which is a working group, um, which we met with in November to get their feedback on these draft goals and objectives. We'd also like your feedback on the draft goals and objectives tonight. Big, big picture ideas here, you know, create and improve multimodal mobility along the Cape Cod Canal area. That's a sort of a lofty statement. Uh, to establish an additional replacement crossing the Cape Cod Canal to, to address the diminishing quality and reliability of year-round connectivity, which is a big word in the study for us. It's connectivity. It's that reliable way that you can get from the mainland of the Cape and the Cape to the mainland. Can you do that way you need to do it? Can you do it in an efficient manner? Over the Cape Cod Canal connectivity, over the Cape Cod Canal, due to the aging segment more and more bridges. So that's a driver for the study is the idea of connectivity, of reliable connectivity. And finally, the objective is create reliable, multimodal, again, connectivity and mobility levels such that the quality of life in the Cape is not diminished by unreliable connectivity across the Cape Cod Canal. Because the bridges don't just connect. You know, one side of Bourne and the other side of Bourne, and they connect, as you said, 215 towns, I'm sorry, 15 towns and 215,000 residents of the Cape, basically with the rest of the world. So they're incredibly important structures and they're important to everybody who lives on the Cape. We also need to create, and this is again our, our proposed draft objective, is create reliable multimodal connection across Cape Cod Canal to maintain public safety. In the event of the need for an emergency evacuation of portions of the Cape and to accommodate first responders trying to access the Cape. Again, bridges, all the lanes aren't open. In the extreme case, all the lanes were closed on a bridge. Serious implications for public safety. That's something that studies have taken into consideration. And finally, going back to the towns that the, that the uh, canal basically cuts in half, ensure that the cross canal connectivity allows life to go on in the normal. Pattern for people in the and San Jose live on either side of the community because they have community activities on both sides. How would we know success when we see it? As soon as we start to think about how well these different alternatives that we came up with work. Um, in the column uh, on the uh, color side of the graphic, you know, we have transportation at the top and measuring things like how well will the vehicles uh, be able to travel around the area, how well the bikes. And the streets be able to move around, or will travel times be like them, these different types of alternatives. So we've got big categories on the one side and all kinds of smaller units of measurement on the other side. So we can try to weigh the value of the uh, success of one alternative of another or another versus another. So again, on, on the left is, is transportation, vehicles, pens, bikes. Down to safety, vehicular safety is the design, design of the standards. As pedestrian and bicycle safety, the environment obviously huge uh, in this area. What are the impacts? There's all kinds of resources, whether they're coastal or weapons or ACEC or public water supply. We know there are many, many out here. Uh, continued community impacts, or impacts to recreational open spaces, or environmental justice neighborhoods. Visual in the case of there is a new bridge, visual implications of the bridge can be very big. Uh, and finally, just what's the feasibility of the alternative from the right way? cost to actually build it and from construction phase impact. So we'll try to pull all this kind of more detailed data together for each one of these potential solutions that we come up with so we can weigh one against the other. And we want to do that evaluation process in a very public way so we have a public involvement 
and our goal is to bring all this information to the public, to you, um, to keep it continuous so you know where we are, you're hearing what we're, we're finding, and you're all sort of on the same page, hopefully around the same time. Um, multiple levels of communication, where obviously we're going to have meetings like this in the public, I've referenced, you know, I'll speak about it again in a minute, with the working group, um, who we will also be meeting with, we'll send out emails, we'll use mail, we'll use my traditional uh, media, like I'm sure you folks might have seen the article that was in the Cape Cod Times, that was a part of that was a result of a uh, um, press release that asked you know, two days, so we want to reach out to people and make sure everybody understands what it is that's going on in the study and where we are. The working group is very important. So this is a group who's basically almost, um, in a way, they're, they're almost like our, our first line of information sharing the project. So we reached out to a number of people who's this selection, whether they were federal, state, uh, local officials. We, worked, we tried to reach out to people who lived in the most affected communities, which in Florida, we think they're a blind sandwich. We tried to find bicycle advocates, regional planning agencies, both on and off, cave, transit agencies, people that are concerned with mm -hmm. water resources and environment, people with recreational. And so we're trying to reach specialized groups of people who have special interest in what we're finding. You can actually bring us also special information. One of the roles of, the, of these folks when we impart information to them is they go back to their organizations and that information starts to filter through their, their own communities and hopefully outside of the communities. So information is always flowing between the project and these special uh, interest groups. Our next steps in the project is to finalize what we're here to do tonight, which is the goals and objectives. Um, we do have a public involvement plan already in the evaluation criteria we showed you. There'll be a study website launched probably within the next six to eight weeks. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the step that we're in is we've done our data collection for existing conditions. The summer of the off-season traffic data has been collected. We're developing a regional traffic demand model, which is basically a computerized model which represents all the major roadways in our study area and beyond. Um, we understand then how traffic moves through the area, so we start to make differences in how roads connect, and if there was any bridge or improve uh, signal timing at an intersection, we'll be able to see in this model how traffic reacts to it, how drivers basically would perhaps change their, their movement as a result of a more uh, efficient travel path that might be up. up offered to them. Um, we coordinate, and obviously with Mike Walsh and the rest of uh, his folks at the Army Corps to understand what the bridge maintenance program for the bridge is, what their long range goals are, and uh, we're identifying these uh, existing issues and constraints that I referenced before, primarily with environmental uh, constraints. Um, our next step after this meeting, and obviously we're working in between, is we have a working group meeting on March of 2015. Uh, this is our schedule for the study. We are in January of uh, 2015 with this uh, public meeting, and then this follows that uh, shorter list that I gave you before with task one, task two, existing conditions, is working into the spring with another public meeting in April. And then task three, again, the alternative development, we'll be back to speak with the public about that in August, and we're working with in July. Uh, task four, the alternatives analysis, we'll be, we'll be picking up right at the end of that. Um, and we'll be having more uh, meetings in August and September. And then finally, at the end, we're expecting a draft report uh, by November of this year. So we're, we're trying to compress the time to keep the project moving because the bridges are getting older and more and keep moving because after our study, it then becomes the NEPA and the NEPA environmental studies, which in themselves will take a few years. So we want to try to keep this moving along as uh, expeditiously as we can while making sure that everybody knows what we're doing. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, Glenn. Uh, I apologize. Thank you. Better here. Change. Yeah, we closed the door because of the pressure change. Uh, so we are going to open it up to uh, questions and answers, but before we do, I just wanted to say a few things. Um, <clears throat> we uh, Once we have a website up and running, uh, anything we uh, we present, uh, and as well as uh, meeting notes and agenda, will be posted to our website. Uh, since we don't have a website up and running, uh, we will be uh, emailing this presentation around uh, to uh, everyone that, that signed up. 
and once we have a new web website, we will post everything. And um, the other primary thing I wanted to say before we do open it up uh, is that we aren't going to be able to answer a lot of your questions because we're very, very early on in the study process. Uh, just want to make that clear that we're, we're at the beginning. Uh, as we move along, we hope to be able to answer a, a lot of questions that we even have ourselves. And so part of our public involvement process is to go out and uh, solicit uh, input from the public. So it helps both um, the comments help us understand the direction we're going, and it also oftentimes highlights things that we didn't necessarily know. So the purpose of us uh, coming out here today is to introduce, but also to hear what everyone has to say. And uh, typically, uh, we, as a courtesy, we open up the floor initially to any uh, federal, state, or local elected officials. If we have any in the audience today, um, feel free to stand up and say a few words. It looks like we don't. I didn't see any, but some may have come uh, late. Uh, somebody's pointing. Somebody's pointing. Okay. Um, the other thing is uh, we have a microphone here. So uh, this is not a public hearing, so you don't necessarily need to say your name. Uh, you feel free to if you'd like. Uh, but so everyone else can hear what it is you're asking, uh, so that we don't have to repeat questions. Uh, he, uh, our gentleman here is going to be uh, handing out the microphone. So with that said, uh, it's like we already have some hands, uh, so feel free. Uh, my name is Jane Logan. I live um, on the Cape, and I would actually put in a sandwich. And I'm wondering. I didn't see anything up there about how much the ships that are going to the canal are going to pay to contribute to the cost of these bridges. So the tent canal is built so that the ships can have safe and shorter passage through the canal, and nothing I've seen includes them helping to pay for any of the costs. Um, I actually emailed the Army Corps of Engineers for staff how many ships go through, and I didn't hear back. But um, they have to they have to share the costs. And will there be studies that show how much this would all cost if bridges could be built differently if they weren't built for the ships to go over them? Uh, and, um, I, mean, I know it's, it's built for ships, but the bottom line is they go for free, and you're looking at charging tolls to Cape Cod to go back to where they live. So once again, um, big business is going to get subsidized by local residents. And it just isn't right. So part of this study has to be how much of the ships going to pay for these bridges that are going up to be maintained? I'll let my feel better. <laughs> that is a great question. I don't have an answer to that question. We do not have a mechanism to charge uh, for usage of the Cape Cod Canal. Uh, is that something that could be introduced? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, I, I don't know. It's the first I, I heard of that. Um, you know, from the Corps' perspective, you know, the federal government took over the canal in the 30s from the, uh, from the Canal Commission, from the state. When the federal government adopted the canal, uh, the federal government also adopted the requirement to provide two highway bridges, one railroad bridge, and a ferry across the canal. The ferry's not a good idea, so we don't provide that. Um, but we're also we're provide I mean we're responsible to provide those two highway bridges and there's no toll on those bridges. Um, the whole discussion about the toll and P3 and all that has kind of entered in with the state study, which I can't talk to. What I can say is that what the Corps of Engineers is doing on this major rehab evaluation study, if the answer is replace the bridge, I can't see that changing um, the rules about the federal government charging toll for that highway bridge. Does that make sense? So it would be, I expect, 100% federally funded. That's my expectation right now.
Uh, good evening, Phil Goddard of the London Beach. This is just a process question. You've got the, obviously jurisdiction from both state and federal governments here, and I'm a little unclear, a little fuzzy on the process that you're doing vis-a-vis -vis the state. It sounds like the state's taking the lead, and you may or may not take their information. I'm just worried about duplication. I'm also thinking that what they come up with would be helpful to you in making your case uh, before Congress to get money, and it would be nice if some of the federal money can help subsidize the state study and so forth. I'm sure maybe not. But uh, just the coordination, I'm a little fuzzy on it. I hope that's knitted together a little more clearly so that um, when you get ready uh, to make uh, recommendations, you're not recommending something uh, before we find out what the feds need to do. Yes, uh, so I can assure you that we are coordinating heavily. And um, it's just the initial start of the process. So we're also uh, really in communication as to how we're going to uh, knit together and really dovetail the two. But I definitely uh, can say that the core is going to rely on a lot of what we produce in terms of uh, data analysis. Uh, simply because um, we're more equipped to do that, one, um, because the, the core is more about navigation of waterways and DOT is more about transportation uh, infrastructure. So um, we uh, are going to provide a lot of information back and forth. Now, uh, in terms of timelines, we're ahead of the core, which actually works out well because, again, we're the ones that are going to be able to do a lot of that data collection and analysis. And that's uh, going to inform what the core is doing. How that is exactly going to be done at this point in time, we're still in, in talks of how best to approach that. Could we get the elected official up there, please? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, just a quick question if this poll that I've seen implemented um, forms a, a, a town that's divided by the canal. You have a dump on one side, there's plenty of people that need to go to the dump from the other side, and then they have to go back. And then the people on the, on the Cape side work the guys that have to go to, say, a Home Depot or Lowe's to get supplies or downtown by the state. We have to go over and come back. So if you're working and going around, you can be back and forth over that bridge five times a day. So more residents going to be subsidized, or will we have residents that uh, uh, are we going to have, have to have no pass to go over the, the bridge, or who's, who's going to pick? How's that going to work? Yeah, at this point, it's undetermined. Uh, so the P3 process is essentially just a procurement method uh, of financing infrastructure. So at this point in time, uh, we don't know what the, the tolling construct will be. It's really, right now, we're just trying to do our analysis, and that analysis will inform a public-private partnership effort that is going on concurrently. Uh, and one of the slides that we uh, presented, uh, one of our goals was to um, establish either uh, an additional crossing or a replacement crossing. So we don't know if it's going to be uh, at this point a, a third uh, toll facility, uh, whether the federal government is going to say that they want to replace the two existing bridges and then we, we don't have to put in a toll facility through a P3 uh, process. So. At this point, we really don't know. It's very early on in our study process. P3, uh, public-private partnership, is going on uh, concurrently, but uh, that's really just to get the ball rolling uh, with uh, concessionaires. So that, that that process also takes time, so we don't want to um, just end-to-end -end all of these processes, so that's going on. And if the end of the study, if uh, P3 is not viable, then that would not proceed. So we really don't know at this point what the uh, what the tolling structure would be, what kind of, uh, what, whether it's additional crossing or replacement crossing. So uh, but that's 
as part of this process, we hope to flesh that out as we go through uh, our you know, identification of issues as well as the development and analysis of alternatives. Just a, a, a real quick uh, second question. Sure. Should those bridges being so old or given to get so old, does it ever become an issue where a, a structure like that falls on into something historical and, and that you can't take it down and you have to continue to be there? Uh, part of our process is to uh, establish the, the historic uh, status, but I'll let Michael speak to that one. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> we see the bridge as, you know, as uh, functional. That's what we want. You know, we're required to provide two highway bridges over the canal. It's looking like it's getting to the point where they need to be replaced. We're doing a study to make that case, and you know, my goal would be to just replace them. That's what I would like to see happen. Um, I've not heard anything about it being you know, on the historic register or anything like that where we would have problems um, taking the bridge down, but we'll delve into that during the study. Thank you. I want to follow up on the first meeting that we had. I have a couple of questions. We spent an awful lot of time at that first meeting on jurisdictional issues on ownership and who's going to replace it, and the state and federal government, and going to the Library of Congress, all kinds of things were brought up at that meeting. Has there been any further research done on that? That's the, that's the first question. Because that really does make a difference on the P3 process versus all kinds of other things, polls and all of those types of things. So the jurisdictional piece who owns what and who's going to build what if anything does get there for replace. So that's, that's question one. My second concern, and I, I hate to sound redundant, but I believe that the study area that we're currently looking at does not, on the born bridge side, expand far enough back. If you look at the traffic, and I know you're doing your studies, all the way back to the Glen Charlie Road up from 25, coming down 6A uh, through the town of Wareham on the Grand Prairie Highway. You really have to take a look at that from a, from a perspective of um, user ease and satisfaction. And it backs up not only on the bridges, it backs up coming in here too. The third issue that is a little disconcerting as well is I'm, I'm hearing two years three years for the study, this phase of it, and the NEPA part of it, and the NEPA part of it, and all of those types of things. The town of Bourne has had some plans in place for a number of years to improve traffic congestion and traffic mobility to the Bourne Bridge, and how we can get people up and down the scenic highway and clean up our entrance to Main Street make our economic development plans a reality. The longer this is put off, because we were told this would be put off until the study is done, the longer the study takes, the longer our plans for the community's economic vitality on the north side of the bridge are put off. And I would really like the Commonwealth to take a look at what it can do in the interim to help us implement what we have tried to be, what we've been planning for several years. And that is something that we're real concerned about. Um, the, the fourth issue is on the, the study group itself. Now, that'll stop the floor. Um, it would be helpful, I think, to anyone who sits on the study group that prior to those meetings, and that's why I think it's going to be in March, that we receive information so that we don't come into those meetings just to hear a presentation and react. We have an opportunity to review the materials that you're going to be presenting, so that we can react in an intelligent manner as opposed to just what I could call meeting. But I'm hoping they can be able to help us with that. Thank you. I'm a representative of Dave Pierre. Thank you. Uh, representative Dave Pierre, third Barnstable District. Some of you may have seen the article. In the newspaper today where i said i was one of the folks that hasn't been convinced of the third crossing yet 
you know, this began with a private meeting in Boston with the secretary, excuse me, the director of Mass Highway telling us how the P3 partnership was going to move forward, not only for this project, but for the Route 3 South uh, project. Um, and I wanted to talk to the federal government and the state government, as I said in the article, to coordinate this together. If we need to get Congressman Keating and we need to get the senators to go down there and pass a special act of the, of the Congress to make one planning process to work together and to coordinate this. Because we're running off with private investors. The previous governor already had a meeting with investors in Boston about who would put money in this. And yet you tell me it's stage five on your chart and we've already had meetings with investors in Boston. Something's going on. There's an invisible hand going on here somewhere. And I don't like it. I don't like it. I'm a David Kate Potter. I grew up here. Most of the folks in this room, a lot of you came here. You came here because you like what we have. And we need to preserve and we need to change. I understand that. But we need to coordinate. We can't have the federal government three years from now telling us what they're going to do with the bridges. And a year from now, we have investors from outside of Massachusetts building a toll bridge through a wildlife refuge area and taking part of the joint base Cape Cod, which will reduce our federal monies that we get for training out there. This has got to be coordinated. And so I want to step up with, with my colleagues in the state and the federal government to say, what do we have to do to allow the federal Army Corps of Engineers planning process to be part of the state Department of Transportation planning process so that we sit at one table, we coordinate with one voice, and we have one plan. Because the last thing I want is a bunch of contractors coming down, building for-profit bridges over the canal, and we have a transportation fiasco at the end of this. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, we'll carry the message back to uh, the Boston office, and uh, we'll see how we can proceed. Thank you for your comments. Could you answer the question about jurisdiction? Yes, yes, um, sure. Yes, thank you. And that was my confusion from before because it, it was not absolutely clear to me about ownership and et cetera. We need to really go back through the records. Um, what I can say right now is the Corps of Engineers owns the bridges. We are responsible, obligated to provide two highway bridges over the Cape Cod Canal, and that's what we have. <laughs> Under that obligation, as these bridges get older, at some point in time, we're stuck with that. We have that question. Do we keep fixing them or do we replace them? We're not talking about abandoning them. Um, so that, that's where we're at right now. So, yes, the Corps of Engineers owns them. We're responsible for them. We're obligated to provide two highway bridges over the canal. Does that answer your question? It does. It's just it was a it was, and I, yeah, I own that. Yeah. So, so in terms of study area, this is our, our study area here, and uh, could all the slides up? Could you highlight uh, again what you uh, were referring to that you felt weren't included in our study area? Well, you didn't come back on 25 far enough. I don't want to get up and point, but you have to go back on 25 to at least uh, exit. <coughs> To the, the last Wareham exit coming in, Glen Charlie Road, right there. Okay, if you, I have the privilege of going the other way on a lot of Fridays, and I get to see the traffic, and it is very many weekends back, way up out of there. So you're only in the study area out a mile, and you really need to come back a little farther beyond the Glen Charlie, okay, going farther north. From farther north than that. Use the microphone. So the yellow dashed line is our regional right. study area. And you need to come nor farther north, farther north than beyond that. that. One exit? One exit. We can do that. Um, and you had another question about uh, the improvements that were underway. Well, and, I, you know, I think that, that was um, a conscious decision that all that planning work for those improvements were underway, as you noted, for, for years. But once the study was, came about, we didn't want to um, move forward with a project that may end up having to be modified and changed based on the study. So we are still uh, going to make improvements, but scaling back a bit. Um, and I guess your fourth question was about advanced material and the working Correct. Group. And, um, you know, at that first meeting of the working group, it was definitely a uh, 
similar style to this, and that's primarily or really the reason was because uh, it was a similar format of introduction. I can assure you future meetings, once we have more content, it will be a, the proverbial roll up your sleeves, your own roll up sleeves, feel free. Um, and it will be more of a working group style where it won't be a presentation at you, it will be uh, whether it's rollout plans, you know, or it will be more interactive and will be a different format. We understand it was a little bit awkward uh, in, in that format. So we will uh, modify that. And that was, we understood that it was that way for a reason, but it will change in the future. And as far as advanced material, um, you know, sometimes advanced material is difficult to send out, not because of file size, but because without the benefit of the narrative or somebody speaking to it, it uh, can oftentimes uh, add, uh, cause confusion, uh, misinformation. So we tend not to send anything out in advance, but we also don't want it to be at a disadvantage. So again, it won't be the present at you, so you then can, can't process it. It'll be a more of a, a sit down, uh, around a uh, smaller table format. Just be prepared for long meetings. Understood. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I just want to go back to the comments about coordinating um, between agencies and states being proactive in what they're looking at is a uh, transportation study and they're looking at traffic and you know, a whole lot of things really that I'm not sure the core is going to be looking at it, it, rightly or wrongly um, I kind of have blinders on in that I don't have to ask the question do I need these bridges I'm obligated to have them <coughs> I'm, I'm obligated to maintain them or replace them the only question I really need to well the first question I need to answer is do I keep just repairing them or do I replace them? If we jump to replace them, then the question is what do I replace them with? And you know, what will that look like? What's the cost? And, and all that will fold into with my study, um, showing the economics of that, so that hopefully the decision makers in Washington are um, willing, eager to uh, provide us the funding to, to do that work. Outside of that, a lot of what the state is doing in their study will help us in, in what the court needs to do. It will, it will help us fill out the story of the importance of these bridges and whatnot. Um, outside of that, you know, the timing is it, it, it is a little bit off. You know, I, I'm very funding limited. Uh, I do not today have funding to conduct the study that I'm talking about conducting. Uh, I have some seed money, which I'm trying to put together a plan for that study. And I'm hoping I will get funds this year to, to initiate that study. But you know, every step along the way in the federal government, pretty much with anything, but uh, the federal government, I need to get funding every year to continue with these studies. And it's not a guarantee. So um, that, that's why it, it takes us some time to make these things happen. Um, my name is Catherine Bumpus. I'm from the school. I think, first of all, I'd like to thank the Army Corps for doing such a good job in maintaining the bridges that we have now because they are still standing and all of us who use them regularly should appreciate that. Um, I think it was um, Mr. Fala from Mount Highway who was quoted in the Chicago Times as saying, when asked, um, what happens to all the cars once they get over the bridge? That, that was the most dangerous question. I'm not sure whether the question was dangerous because of the answers or because of um, the can of worms that that question opened. But um, that can of worms is something that all the communities on Cape Cod are struggling with. Roads are the tip of the infrastructure iceberg when it comes to issue, infrastructure issues on Cape Cod. We have water issues, we have wastewater issues, we have municipal solid waste issues. If you're going to bring us more people <laughs> or make it easier to get here, um, I hope you consider that increased conductivity can have a negative impact on our quality of life as well as a positive impact, in, as your study point suggests. Um, that's my Cape Wide comment. 
my second comment is near and dear to the heart of my village in Whistle. And that is that on any given day, between 3 and 4 percent of the cars going over the Bourne Bridge could be accounted for by vehicles getting on a ferry to Martha Um There's been an interest in Whistle in encouraging some of that traffic not to come onto the Cape, but to think about an alternative course. And I hope that if the state is considering ways to mitigate the quantity of traffic coming on to the Cape, that they consider where that traffic is going and if there are alternatives and ways to support those alternatives that might be less expensive than some of the infrastructure driven. So I think the, the uh, answer to both your questions uh, are these are things that we're going to consider. So you know, connectivity can have a negative effect as well in terms of the quality of life. So that's going to be something as, as we get further along the process that we're going to try to um, whether quantify or qualitatively assess what the benefits uh, and impacts are to those kinds and one of our criteria on our uh, community impacts. So, something we're going to look at. And uh, so your suggestion about uh, alternative ports for um, travel to the islands, I think that, so that's a perfect example of uh, the public involvement process, uh, why, we, why we do it, because that's a, a great suggestion. That's something that we can consider as part of our study, that uh, we can look at uh, Steamship Authority, uh, you know, see if they have data on uh, uh, trip patterns, on uh, where they're coming from, and possibly uh, you know, courage uh, reports. Uh, now, the difficulty obviously is that, uh, that that's a vehicular ferry. Uh, I know New Bedford, uh, New Bedford has a uh, ferry service, but it is not vehicular. So you know, that's something you have to assess as well, the, the, the want of a vehicle versus those that are just willing to uh, use a ferry service without a vehicle. So um, bottom line, I guess that's something to consider as we go through the study process. Hello, my name is Joe Crimmins Jr. I'm the partner in the Zuquarium, and I would like to suggest that Route 25 be extended over the Warren Bridge over to Exit 2 of the Mid Cape Highway. This would allow traffic headed north on Route 6 to get off uh, of Route 6 before the Sagamore Bridge. Do you have any comments on that? So uh, you're, you're suggesting a connection uh, on the south side of the canal from Route 6. Uh, Route 25 over the Warren Bridge over the Exit 2 over the Exit 5. Okay. To the base. Yeah. Um, well, we, uh, we as the study have not yet laid out our, our lines on, on maps, but uh, I think as everybody's seen in the, in the news, there's the the P3 process has, uh, as a proxy, they're, they're using certain alternatives so that they can um, pitch to concessionaires. And, and one of the alternatives uh, does look at a mid canal crossing, so essentially midway between the two bridges, and that essentially doing the same thing. Uh, so that traffic coming down 25, destined for Route 6, doesn't have to do the, uh, the sort of curve on 25 and then come over. Uh, the Bourne Bridge and then go up to Route 6, it uh, would provide a connection across. Um, now, we haven't got far enough in our process to actually look at any kind of those alternatives more concretely than just what you've seen or as lines on maps. So, but we are using uh, those, those two as foundations for when we look at our long term alternatives. Uh, so, uh, but we also understand already, and we've had, uh, we've been on Joint Base Cape Cod, and we understand that there's a lot of impacts. In that area, so that's something uh, that's a concern to um, Joint Base Cape Cod as well as um, the Commonwealth. So uh, we're going to have to uh, have our due diligence and document the both benefits and impacts <coughs> for that that alternative in the future part of our process. <coughs> Thank you.
No, I don't know. The, uh, the woman behind me. Okay. My name is William Chair, and I think this boils down to two issues. One is the destruction and integrity of the bridges, and the other one is traffic. I would like to ask a question of the Corps of Engineers regarding the destruction of the integrity. These bridges are about eight years old, five years younger than I am. <clears throat> um, the Brooklyn Bridge is 130 years old. Now, I understand it's a suspension bridge, so it's a different structure, but it has to deal with the same salt, salt atmosphere that we have to deal with in the Cape Cod Canal. The Brooklyn Bridge has a 1600 foot span. Our bridges have 616 foot spans. Brooklyn Bridge has six lanes and it carries per lane twenty-five thousand vehicles per day. Our bridges in the summertime, both of them carry eighteen thousand vehicles per day. In the summertime, this is a high low. So let's say it's 25. It's not even up to the, the, the Brooklyn Bridge. My question is before we go into a, a complete multi year study on the integrity of the bridges, I hope the Corps of Engineers, which shouldn't take that long, they probably already have the data, to determine what is the structural integrity of these bridges. And I think I heard at the beginning of the discussion, you're looking at two or three decades at least. Well, I don't know that. I don't know. Uh, so my question is, why can't we get that out of the way? Uh, the, the traffic flow is not that far. But we shouldn't have to deal with the traffic flow depending upon what you're going to decide to do with the structural integrity of the bridge. They have that is to get the right way. Well, the, the way I understand your question, okay, the structural integrity, the, the bridges are um, structurally sound, and thus all the maintenance that we do on the bridges yearly, every other year, however often it is. Um, and really, my study is to look at is that a worthwhile investment for bonds, or does it make sense to make a capital investment of replacing a bridge instead? There are some problems with the bridges um, that we can't get away from, and the narrow bridges, they're functionally, what we call functionally obsolete, um, which has a safety impact, you know, those narrow lanes. Um, so, yeah, we have a, a lot of data on the integrity these bridges. We inspect them um, every five years as it is every five years, every two. Um, as required. Um, and anytime we find deficiencies, we repair those deficiencies. So now can we keep repairing these bridges? Yes. Does it keep getting more and more expensive to, to re make repairs? And yes. Does it have more and more impacts to the communities every time we make repairs? Longer delays? Yes. So that, that's what we're trying to look at. From a federal perspective, now the traffic side of it, from the course perspective, you know we care, but that's not our charge. Our charge is to just provide two highway bridges over the, you know, I mean, I'd like to see us provide two. If we're going to replace adequate highway bridges, not I and mean, these bridges were designed for early figures. I saw one two million vehicles a year. You know, we're looking at. 37 million, 36 million, something like that, vehicles per year now. It's just, it's, it's, the, the landscape is different. And so that's what we're going to be looking at in our study. Um, what do we do with the two bridges that the Corps needs to provide? In the traffic stuff, <laughs> I apologize, I didn't mention.
to see the camera first. But uh, I know we're moving to the uh, left of the camera. Could you go into the um, this public-private partnership a little bit? Because just I want to just start by saying I don't think you solve public problems with private enterprise. Number one, number two, this started out as a private enterprise and failed, and the government took it over. Why would you think it's going to be different now? Now with all the regulations and everything. Um, and number three, these investors, what are they just not keeping up with the costs? I mean, we're all talking about what we're going to get the money for these costs and all the studies and everything. Are they going to just come in at the end and just start collecting tolls? I mean, really, I, haven't, I think you really need to go into those details. Is that something you're seriously considering? Is a public private partnership for these, for these bridges or tolls? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, so I, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the public-private partnership because that's really not what we're here for tonight, nor is it my specialty and it's a separate effort uh, led by others. But essentially, uh, it's what we call a, a design, build, maintain, operate. Uh, there can be other uh, forms of it, just design, uh, build, uh, and maintain. Or, and so the, the primary... Um, it's a procurement method, and the idea is to get um, what they call concessionaires, and then it's a group of uh, financiers, uh, contractors that are engineers, as well as construction contractors that work as a team to come in, uh, design it, um, build it, and then they operate it, and they do have to collect tolls. That is the um, yeah, the only reason that private interest would um, be involved, be interested, is if there was a return on their investment. Um, now, speaking to your um, to work 80 years ago as opposed to now, there, there are a lot of um, public-private partnership uh, projects throughout the, the nation. It's actually um, uh, becoming more common, and without getting into uh, a sort of long discussion about the highway trust fund at the federal level, um, essentially it boils down to uh, the infrastructure of the nation, uh, you know, throughout the Really, uh, a lot of it was built through the 50s and 60s, especially the interstate system into the 70s. It's reaching the end of its useful life, and the Highway Trust Fund, which is the, um, the federal government's uh, collection of gas taxes to put it back to the states, really, uh, it, they admittedly, that it's not. Uh, it was not constructed, to use the same term, uh, with the end of useful life of infrastructure in mind. So it essentially it, it's been running out uh, pretty much year after year, so they have to continue to put money into it. So the idea is to get uh, the vital infrastructure done with, um, with private funding. Now, um, even though it sounds like um, you're really just um, having infrastructure cost more, there's a lot of infrastructure out there that needs to be replaced, and um, we just, the state and the federal government just doesn't have the money to do it. Um, so they. So even if we were to build it on the Commonwealth, we would still uh, have to borrow that money and, and pay back bonds or GANs, which are, which are uh, grant anticipation notes. So really, even if we did uh, Commonwealth build something, we would still have to borrow the money as well. So there's still uh, that borrowing aspect, whether it's we borrow it directly or financier, financiers come in. So, um, so it's really similar. Now, obviously, we can split hairs about sort of return on investments in, in dollars. But again, coming back to my initial point, this is not the P3 process. That's a procurement method. We're going to conduct our study, uh, and that is going to inform the P3 process. So that's really all I can say about it, because I actually am not a P3 person, and that's not why I'm standing up here today. Um, it is necessary, but again, this is a study that's informing a separate effort. There are other P3 meetings, and. Uh, those are posted on our website, so if people would like to attend those, they're more than welcome to. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, what, um, 
Mike from the, the core was asking, uh, does, does P3 only come into play on an on a additional or third crossing? And um, that, that is essentially one uh, one way of P3 would come into play. The core, uh, through working with the federal their federal government, our federal government, uh, they uh, would replace them. It wouldn't be a P3. So P3 is just one option, and so we're looking at a number of different options. So it's not a P3 is not a, a done deal by any means. This takes one in the purpose that are up. Hi, uh, from a different point of view, I'm Brittany. I live on Sandwich Road in Sacramento Village, and we're right on the front lines of this. We see exactly what happens. So as you're gathering public input, if there's a way that you can particularly let the residents that live right there next to these bridges, next to all this, um, know so that we can give input. We have a lot of input. I know I do. <laughs> I'm sure my neighbors do. Um, I mean, you know, we see this all, all year long and all summer long. Every Sunday afternoon, we're trapped in our houses. We can't go grocery shopping. We can't do anything. Yeah. It's, we have people blasting their stereos in the parking lot. It's developing from our house because the traffic's not moving. So it's just, if you can keep in mind the residents that live right there, you know, please let us know if there's meetings or if you can have a meeting with like the residents of Sagamore Village, the residents of Warren Village, so that we can let you know what we see and what we feel about this since we're right there. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, so there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. Um, would you like to be on our working group? Great. Um, so it's, it's very common for us, you know, when we go into a process, we put together a working group, but we don't necessarily know everybody that should be on it. So this is one way. Um, I, I've been involved in many studies where uh, we just have um, neighborhood groups that are on our working group. Uh, so. Uh, Great, that would be great if you could, uh, and you would act as that conduit to your, your neighborhood. And if you know of any other neighborhood associations that would be interested, that's we would be uh, happy to have a representation. Please talk to me afterwards. Uh, uh, Thank you. This is Elizabeth Ellis. I live in the village of Sagamore. Um, I want to thank the Department of Transportation for including the public right from the beginning. I'm sure you know about the platform on the south side of the canal that many of us feel was shoved down our throats with no transparency. And that many local leaders feel um, was a hasty decision on the part of the state with no transparency and it's totally incompatible and detrimental to local conditions. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm dragging this in because you talked about um, multimodal connectivity. And I have to assume you're talking about more than bicycles and joggers. You must be talking about trains and buses. Is that correct? That's correct. And my comment in tying it in with the platform is this aren't we putting the cart before the horse? Not only do local, do local people feel that if this platform is a good idea as part of the master plan and that we will have it, that it is in the wrong place. And it's $2.3 million in a state that has a debt that varies from $328 million to $1 billion, depending on who you believe. And I just think that, uh, I, I do thank you for the uh, information tonight, and I'm, I'm actually behind the third bridge as Mr. Kayer calls it, it's a replacement bridge, and it's, it's essential. I was against it when I thought it was another way for tourists to jam up our roads, but it's something that has to happen, and probably the sooner the better. But again, um, I, I wish you would postpone spending that $2.3 million and then have to rip it up and move it somewhere else when your breach plans and your master plan is done. And I will be behind it when it happens. If it's a good job, I have confidence that it will be. Thank you. Steve, the gentleman in front of the classes. Uh, 
But thank you. Uh, it's far too early for me to take a position on this, but certainly I'm gathering all this background information. Uh, first would be a question and then a couple of comments. But the first question would be, has there ever been a comprehensive study on the construction cost and 50-year maintenance cost of a tunnel versus a bridge? Another word. That's the answer to that. Uh, of course, uh, I, as far as uh, crossing the canal goes, I thought for some time that uh, in eventuality, rail is going to take some of the heat off of road traffic, and uh, I think that's yet to come. But in the meantime, uh, any project that we've discussed so far is going to have a major impact on the town of Bourne in a number of different ways. And it, should be a very, very serious consideration uh, uh, to uh, work with board on this set that should develop. Uh, what I uh, would say is that there are at least two projects I could, of the Department of Transportation that I could enthusiastically support. One would be to build a frontage road, limited access road, alongside scenic highway will alleviate the problem of scenic highway. The land, I think, is relatively available, and that should be done. And, and previously it was engineered uh, that you could come from scenic highway and uh, access Route 25 by Nightingale Pond without coming into that Bourne Rotary, which is a disaster. The second is the Department of Transportation get on with it the previously engineered Southwest Connector to take the strain of traffic off of Sandwich Road. Those have been all pre-engineered and thought out, and I would much rather see the money spent on those projects while we wait to see what we could do about a canal crossing. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, suggestions. Uh, um, it is too early in the process uh, to really uh, talk about some of these the benefits and impacts of these options, but uh, improvements to see the highway uh, are something that we would be looking at, um, whether it's referred to as a front intro, but more just looking at seeing highway as a whole. Uh, south side connector, uh, that one, um, similar issues uh, to uh, the alternative referenced earlier is that uh, joint base Cape Cod, uh, so when south side connector was uh, designed, uh, it's, I guess I would say that the Joint Base Cape Cod was there, but there now there are a lot more um, environmental constraints and also uh, permitting processes that would um, that make the South Side connector um, not infeasible. But uh, they, we would have to really assess the, the impacts, and, and we know that they're significant. So. Um, South side connector while designed, it was designed a long time ago, and so uh, it's probably not a uh, feasible design at this point. Uh, so, but we will uh, look at uh, other roadway improvements as part of our process. If I might, environmental concerns are going to be a major thing to overcome on a new bridge, no matter where you put it. Understood. That's uh, part two is the environmental which is the uh, environmental permit. Thank you. Uh, my name is <clears throat> my name is Steve Buckley. I'm from Chad, so we're a little downstream from all the traffic here, but we get it anyway. At least part of it. So, uh, uh, in a previous life, I used to prepare uh, environmental impact statements for federal agencies, and it's curious to me the process uh, I think what the gentleman one of the first questions had to do with the process and how it works and the idea that there's going to be a study and then basically another study meaning an environmental impact statement uh, with the state and the feds later on as a two-step thing um, maybe this has happened before but it's not usual it's unusual as far as my experience is concerned but as far as there really being a two-step process where a lot of the stuff 
gets decided ahead of time. So by the time it gets to step two, what you'll end up hearing is, oh, well, we already talked about that. Because I'm reading, uh, what I was able to scribble down because this wasn't made available ahead of time. I was able to scribble down and said, step one, we're going to have publicly vetted alternatives. Now, publicly vetted is kind of a fuzzy word, but it means basically people have made decisions on what the alternatives are and what they aren't. So the idea of that somehow there'll be a process and then another process again that that will, if nothing else, confuse people. Or if they missed the meetings before, they're going to be told, and this happens all the time in any type of community meetings, where, oh, you missed? Well, we talked about that five months ago. We already talked about that. You're too late. So, so I see the same thing happening here. But what I'm wondering, though, is that the, Massachusetts Highway Department has a project, project development and design guide, which actually is a misnomer because it's not a guide. It says that it's required to be followed, and there's 80 pages that cover public involvement in one of the chapters on public involvement. It's 80 pages. It's quite specific about how this is supposed to go. So I'm wondering, is this process following Mass DOT's requirements for public involvement according to its own procedures? Uh, so, we had a few comments. Thank you. Uh, you also had uh, sort of a primary comment, which I um, respectfully completely disagree with you on. Uh, you know, conceptual planning studies, which is what we're doing right here, uh, are extremely common to proceed uh, the environmental permitting. Now, there, there's uppercase study and lowercase study. Some people refer to the environmental permitting process as studying. Um, the primary difference is that conceptual planning studies um, are, are done at the higher level to look at a wide range of alternatives and uh, with a, a number of different uh, criteria. The uh, environmental permitting is a uh, required uh, process by both the federal government and the state government through NEPA and NEPA, and it's extremely common to have both of them. So it's not, it may be slightly confusing when you use the term study twice, which is why we commonly refer to it as we're doing a conceptual planning study. It gets moved forward into project development, which is environmental permitting and design. So those are the conceptual planning study and project development are two distinct processes. So that, that is not common at all in the time that I've been doing uh, planning studies. Uh, and to your question about public uh, participation, um, that the guidebook is one uh, is one use, but uh, we are following uh, a, we have a public participation plan, which is a separate document, and uh, so that one um, supersedes that right there because it's uh, the public participation plan is more recent. So that is the one we're following, and I emailed it to you. Uh, so. Uh, that's one we're going to um, follow in terms of uh, public outreach, both through the media as well as email distribution. It also uh, applies to accessibility of, of meeting rooms like this and uh, also providing information after the meetings in an accessible format. So yes, Terrence, we will be following our public participation plan uh, as closely as possible. There are elements of it that are um, suggested and not necessarily required. So those are things that you have to weigh in the benefits and options. And for example, um, whether you need to provide a translator at every meeting, you really have to assess uh, what your demographics are in the area, whether you have limited efficiency. So those are things you look at the, the numbers, and those are more, do you have enough persons that do not speak English, and what language do you speak, and provide a translator? So things like that are, are, are things all part of our process, and uh, we have to look at them to see if uh, it's a necessary uh, spending of resources. The gentleman. My name is John Miller. I live in Manhattan, um, Born. I have a couple of um, something like process questions. I'll start with observation. Uh, one of the slides that you put up that showed criteria for the study, you don't have to go back to it. Uh, I would note that, no, if you're going to go back a little further than that one. Uh, oh, no, actually, that's the one. No, yeah, go back to that one. Okay, so 
So approximately, I'm just giving you an eyeball and guess, it's somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of that slide is pedestrian and bicycle issues. Of just the space that it occupies visually on the slide. Um, I hope that the final study is not 30 to 40 percent pedestrian and bicycle issues. Um, the reason I'm pointing that out is that I'm actually here to ask questions about pedestrian bicycle issues. But my experience, and please don't take this personally, it's simply a fact that I'm stating that DOT studies typically look like this in the beginning. And the content of the study has a slightly larger number of words than appear on that slide addressing pedestrians and bicycles that are typically lifted as boilerplate from something else. And the amount of resources devoted towards pedestrian and bicycle issues during the study is very close to zero. So my question is, for when you talked about addressing bicycle connectivity issues, um, how much are you actually going to address them? And let me roll this into one other question. It's not clear from your presentation whether this is a study about a third bridge or a canal region transportation study. Clearly, a third bridge is an issue that has motivated this study, but you're billing it as a canal region transportation study. So my question is, is it really going to be that issues other than the bridge get fair billing and equal amount of attention as the third bridge? And again, I'm going to roll this all into one question, which is always a mistake in this setting, I know, but I'm taking my chances. Um, for example, on the pedestrian and bicycle issues, I think there's a lot of pedestrian and bicycle canal region issues that do not have to do with the bridge. And where I see 30% of your criteria dedicated to pedestrian and bicycles by the way this slide presents it, I hope that at least Sincere due diligence will be given to pedestrian and bicycle issues other than the bridges in this canal region transportation study. Um, and I'm going to actually, I'm going to give you one example. Um, there's a rail line on the south side of the canal. And although you said that the Corps of Engineers maintained the bridges and the the DOT maintains the connectivity. The Corps of Engineers maintains beautiful parallel to the canal bike paths at their expense and provides them and makes them available to the public. The south side one has serious connectivity issues because it's bordered by a rail line. And anyone accessing that bike path has to cross the rail line. Right? There was a little brouhaha uh, over six months or 18 months ago about you know, trespassing signs. Um, on that, and it's an issue that involves both the Corps of Engineers and the DOT, and it's hard to get you both in the same moment at the same time that we have you here tonight. And this is a canal region transportation study. I'm hoping, and I have to request, you can do whatever you want with that request, that you include a detailed study of the issues of pedestrian and bicycle access to the pedestrian and bicycle facility that the Corps of Engineers maintains, and the conflicts with rail along there. Um, the DOT has actually made great strides in the last six months to provide legal pedestrian access to that. If you're talking about true connectivity, there's not sufficient access at this time for that bike path to be useful connectivity to the Gallo Ice Rink, to all places that are reasonable bicycle destinations. Just getting from the bike path to the bridges is, is requires you to cross no trespassing signs. Um, so there's serious connectivity issues, and I hope that this study does a, a fair, what that issue deserves study of connectivity between the bike paths on both sides of the town, especially the south side, and other DOT facilities. Um, so that is uh, a major issue. Of course, there are major issues with the transport of bicycles and pedestrians across the bridges whether the existing bridges are safe and what the Corps of Engineers' obligations are. I'm not sure what a highway bridge means. If you read 
in these streets. According to the state of Massachusetts, it means pedestrians and bicycles. The highway includes pedestrians and bicycles. I believe the federal statute has the same description in it. I've always wanted to ask in a public forum. So uh, that's one question for the DOT. Is will they really do a detailed study of pedestrian bicycle access and connectivity of the bike paths? That's one question. So that, well, my second question is for the Corps of Engineers. I've always wanted to ask this in public. Do they actually believe and will they stand up in public and certify that the, that the sidewalks across the canal are safe? A very simple question. You either have the answer or a simple question. So those are two questions I'd like to have answers to tonight. So does that question to the DOT supersede your prior boil down questions? Well, I would, I I would suggest. So my question to the DOT encapsulates this. To yeah. answer that question, I think you'll be answering all this. Okay. So I, I was actually just. Doing it. So um, you know, our, our this, this is just one slide. We have another slide that. You know, so add the two, it's less than 30 percent of what the eyeball percent is. Um, but no, it, in directly, yes, it's intended to, to look at that bicycle and pedestrian uh, connectivity and issues and to try to solve problems. This this isn't uh, just looking at uh, canal crossing connectivity. Um, <clears throat> so you know, I think growing pains to the DLT over the years. Um, you know, for the past, since uh, 2009, when we uh, 